Hello and welcome to Why You're Wrong, the show where we take a closer look at football's biggest narratives to separate fact from fiction and find out what you might be missing. And this week we take a look at Manchester City closing in on a possible FA Cup League and Champions League treble and ask whether Pep's men can truly be considered the equals of Alex Ferguson's 1999 Manchester United. With multiple titles, outstanding football, a 100-point season and the best attacking record in Premier League history, it seemed like Pep Guardiola could do little more with his time at Manchester City other than winning the Champions League. But even in that regard, he could overperform, with the potential to lift the European Cup this season as part of a remarkable treble, equaling the greatest achievement of the division's most celebrated coach, Alex Ferguson. But comparisons between the Catalan and the former Manchester United boss stir up strong feelings. It's not simply that many feel Fergie was the better manager, but there's also outrage in some quarters at the two being placed side by side, a sense that to rank a current coach against a former great is somehow sacrilegious. But should it be? The 98-99 Manchester United season, along with Arsenal's Invincibles of 2004, has come to be seen as the high watermark of English football. At the time, no English club had triumphed in Europe for 15 years, and United had not been continental kings for 40, so breaking that duck not only filled a long empty spot in the trophy cabinet, but created the legend for multiple stars of that team. Ask anyone when Giggs, Scholes, Beckham and the rest became Man United royalty, and chances are they'll point to 1998-99. But the thing is, the idea of that season is no longer completely aligned with reality. Aside from the Champions League final, that year's most memorable moment might be Ryan Giggs' solo goal against Arsenal in the FA Cup semi-final, but the Welshman missed half the campaign with injury, starting just 20 league games. Paul Scholes started only 24 and featured as often as Nicky Butt, while Solskjaer, the eventual hero at the Camp Nou, was in the starting lineup just nine times in domestic play. So if it seems insulting to compare Grealish or Gundogan to these Premier League icons, it's worth noting that Alex Ferguson himself preferred less heralded players at times. And on the home front, it wasn't as impressive a season as you might expect. Cole and York combined for 35 goals in the Prem, fewer than Haaland by himself this year, and outstripped by Kane and an out-of-sorts Son too. And though that was enough to make United top scorers in the division, they still netted less often than Arsenal have this year. Their defence, meanwhile, looked sharp on the surface, conceding under a goal a game, but it was still only fourth best in the league, letting in more than twice as many as Arsene Wenger's insane backline, which allowed just 17 in 38 matches. On wins, they come up short too, triumphing in 22 games, equaled by Eric Ten Hag's Man United in his maiden campaign this season. That's how they ended up lifting the title with just 79 points, a tally which wouldn't have won them the league in a single season since 1999. That's right, no one has been crowned champions with so few points since, not even Leicester. So what about City? Well, Arsenal may have fallen off at the tail end of this year, but Man City still had plenty to do, with an eight-point deficit heading into the season's climax, as well as the demands of the FA Cup and tough European ties against Bayern and Real Madrid. Not only did they manage it, but they actually got better during that period, and they have the best defence and attack in the Prem this season, both by real goals and expected goals. If you look across Europe's top five leagues, they once again are top offensively, and though five teams allowed fewer goals, only two allowed less XG against, and those by a fraction of an XG. For all the talk of them starting the season badly, they ended up with 89 points, more than they've had in two of the last three seasons, and if they hadn't thrown those last two games, let's be honest, then they'd have been just one point off the pre-Guardiola record and way ahead of anything that Ferguson ever got. In league play, this is the best team in the world at both ends of the pitch. Europe for once has been similarly straightforward. The citizens were handed an easy group, easier than United's in 1998, which included Bayern and Barcelona, but since then the Sky Blues have beaten the German and Spanish champions, also the Champions League holders, and by some margin, scoring 14 goals without conceding one in three home fixtures in the knockouts. United, meanwhile, largely got out of their group by battering Bronby twice, and they faced a weak knockout bracket with champions Real Madrid exiting to Dinamo Kiev. Even the Bayern side they scraped past in the final were not German champs, having finished second to Kaiserslautern the term before. Now, of course, Pep has had incredible resources to work with. City's current squad cost around 960 million euros to assemble, second only to Chelsea's worldwide, and almost double that of title rivals Arsenal on 530 million. 
but Alex Ferguson was back too. The core of his treble winning outfit might have been academy graduates, but he broke the club transfer record twice in the summer of 1998. First to bring in Yapstam for 10 million, then an all-time high for a defender, and then to add Dwight York for 12.6 million. The world record was just over 21 million at the time, and new research suggests that adjusted for inflation, those two transfers would clock in at more than 200 million pounds combined today. City's financial might might be more obvious, but it's not altogether unprecedented. So perhaps this sounds like I'm saying Pep is better, Man City are better, but that's not my point. I feel confident in saying that this Manchester City side would comfortably beat that Man United side if they could play one another. Fitness, tactics, squad depth and preparation are simply on another level these days, and Pep's current side could even compete with 90s outfits for raw physicality, with the whole backline, Rodri, KDB and of course Haaland, all athletic powerhouses. But that's not really the point. City, of course, have not yet won two of the three trophies they need to match their City rivals, and that Man United team did something which at the time was considered borderline impossible. They had to play the two best teams in Italy on their way to European glory, their FA Cup run was historically tough, with Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal and Newcastle in their way, and when they did eventually lift the final trophy with those last gasp goals against Bayern, they did it without Scholes or Keane. They have a deserved place in the pantheon of great sides. What I'm really arguing against here is the collective nostalgia which blinds us to the reality of the game's past. Spend a few minutes on football Twitter and you'll start to believe that Zidane and Ronaldinho were turning in 10 out of 10 performances every week, that every member of Carlo Ancelotti's Milan team was an all-time great, that Terry and Tony Adams and Fernando Hierro never lost concentration or got nutmegged. Compare a present player to one from the past and it's as if you've likened a Marvel movie to The Godfather. Reverence for the game's legends is how you show you know what you're talking about. It's okay to remember these players and teams and managers fondly, but when we buy into the idea that the present is necessarily inferior to the past, we're missing what's great about the modern game. Different clubs have distinct styles. Fewer players get their legs broken with reckless tackles. The sport is as much about smarts and innovation as it is about desire and work rate. This is progress, but we allow pundits who haven't played for 20 years and journalists who idealise the 90s to convince us it isn't. Comparing Pep's potential treble winners to Fergie's triple champions is not unreasonable or disrespectful, it's natural, and the attempts to close down discussions like this are part of a larger conservative impulse in the sport. It should be resisted if only to annoy United fans. So that's our show this week. Let us know what you think in the comments. How do you rate the treble winners or the invincibles against the best sides of today? If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Send in your suggestions for future topics and we'll see you next time.